Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All of us. So individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. Diseases that are the greatest threat to us are diseases that, can, that are severe and that also can be transmissible from person to person. If you have a severe disease that can't be transmitted from person to person, the threat that it poses is much more limited than if it could be transmitted from person to person. Because if it can be transmitted, there's potentially no one in sight. It could sweep over an entire population. And similarly, something that's transmissible from person to person but it's not very severe, even though it could sweep over the population, the negative effect won't be as great as if it were severe. So I think uh, the, the most important starting point for assessing the threat posed by emerging diseases is to recognize that we have to be focused on how severe diseases are or could become and how trans transmissible from person to person diseases are or could become. And this really is an evolutionary question. We're trying to ask, could a disease that might get into a new human population from an animal population or from another human population maintain its, both its transmissibility and its severity. Throughout about 20 years of testing, a fairly simple generalization uh, serves to uh, provide an understanding for most of the variation in the harmfulness of disease organisms. And particularly, it explains virtually all of the instances of very harmful infectious diseases that can be maintained and transmitted in, in human populations. And that, the, the, the essence of that theory is summarized in this quote. When pathogens can be efficiently transmitted from immobile hosts, natural selection favors extensive exploitation of the host. So it favors parasite variants that are competing with each other that are acting more like predators, taking a lot of those host resources and converting them into parasite reproduction. And so as a consequence of that high level of exploitation, as a byproduct, really, we get severe disease. Because vectors, things like mosquitoes and tsetse flies and sand flies, because they will bite individuals, acquire an infection, and then they do the moving from an infected individual to an uninfected individual, transmission doesn't depend on mobility or health of the host. Even deathly ill people can still serve as a source of infection. And if that state of, of severe illness as a result of high degrees of exploitation of the host, then there'd be plenty of progeny of that pathogen that's been replicating inside of that host to infect a mosquito in a small unit of blood. And so uh, one way of thinking about this is that a parasite that is transmitted by a vector like a mosquito is using the vertebrate host, like a human, as a resource base for high degrees of exploitation, high levels of replication, and the mosquito as an agent for mobility. And this idea has been tested in a number of ways. I'm just going to give you the results of one test, which compares how harmful vector-borne diseases of humans are when they're not treated relative to uh, pathogens that rely on um, direct contact for transmission. These are respiratory tract pathogens in this particular slide. And so the important point is that these distributions differ. In the green uh, set of risers, we've got the distribution of mortality per untreated infection 
for vector-borne pathogens. And you can see it's fairly evenly distributed from the left, which are mild pathogens that kill less than one in a thousand infections, to the right, which are really harmful pathogens that kill more than one in ten of untreated infections. And in contrast, directly transmitted pathogens are um, heavily loaded on the mild side. The vast majority of, uh, in this case, the respiratory tract pathogens of humans are in the mildest category. So this is just one example of a test that actually confirms the prediction that these vector-borne pathogens should have evolved to be more exploitative, more harmful than uh, directly transmitted pathogens. So what this allows us is to get a sense of why diseases like um, sleeping sickness and um, typhus and uh, falciparum malaria, why these are some of the scourges of human health and why diseases like the rhinovirus are so mild. The directly transmitted pathogens rely on people being healthy enough to get up and move around to contact other people, sneeze on other people, cough on other people for their transmission. Vector-borne pathogens don't. As I said, there are a lot of other tests that all confirm this idea that natural selection far from favoring benign coexistence between parasites and hosts looks like they favor sometimes predator-like uh, exploitation of hosts for the predator's benefit and at our price. Okay, so if we think in terms of emerging diseases, we might then say that if a, a new pathogen of humans is a vector-borne pathogen, we should look at it very carefully, because if that escapes and becomes well adapted to humans, let's say if it came into humans from another species, then it could be a long-term problem. But really, I would say whenever we get this hunch, then we have to ask, do the local conditions permit this kind of uh, pathogen to take hold? And the answer might be different for the United States than it would be, let's say, for um, Bangladesh or Nigeria. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that if we look at these orange-red risers, the, the data that per, uh, correspond to directly transmitted pathogens, <coughs> we do see that most of these pathogens are in the most mild category. But we see, see that there are some diseases that are caused by pathogens that will kill high percentages, you know, over 1 percent or over 10 percent of the untreated people. So these are diseases caused by, for example, the smallpox virus or mycobacterium tuberculosis um, or the whooping cough uh, bacterium. And so the question is, is this just noise in the system? Is, in fact, natural selection not very, very powerful in shaping the host parasite association? Or is there some other variable that might be important that we're missing when we're just talking about respiratory tract pathogens as though they all relied on host mobility. And as you might suspect from my raising that question, I would say the answer is um, that there really may be other variables that we'd be glossing over by grouping all these respiratory tract pathogens into one group. And in particular, I think the, the key variable is durability in the external environment. If a disease organism is durable in the external environment, then that disease organism depends on host mobility for transmission less than one that is not durable in the external environment. If we imagine an infected host on the left, and that infected host, if it has respiratory tract pathogen, may be coughing out those pathogens into the environment, or, you know, that pathogens may be running out in secretions in the nose and other places. And uh, they then are left in the environment, and if that pathogen was only viable in the external environment for, let's say, a matter of hours, then Transmission really does depend on a person moving around and contacting other people. But if, imagine if that pathogen were viable in the external environment for months or even years. Think of how many uninfected individuals might come into that spot where that infected individual released the pathogens. And then you ask the question, under those circumstances, is the mobility of an infected host necessary for transmission? I think the answer would generally be no. The more durable the pathogen, the less mobile the inf infected host has to be. So that's a hypothesis that's based on the general idea that I raised at the outset, which is that we expect that harmfulness of uh, disease organisms should be related to their dependence on host mobility for transmission. The question is, how do you test it? Well, again, we can test this idea uh, fairly easily, at least in the first stage of testing by looking at all those respiratory tract pathogens for which we have information on mortality rate and untreated infections and information on durability in the external environment and see whether the two are correlated. 
And the answer is yes, they're very strongly correlated. So up here on the top, we've got the smallpox virus as the most lethal of those respiratory tract pathogens of humans. And they last for months to years. Um, next on the list, we've got mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is, kills about 5% in untreated infections. <clears throat> and that lasts in the external environment for weeks to months, and so on down the line. The important point is that the ranking of mortality, which goes from pretty nasty pathogens, 10% mortality for untreated infection, to things that are really mild, causing less than two deaths, for example, for Haemophilus influenzae in 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 um, infections. We see that a that lot, lot of that variability, and that variability is strongly correlated with uh, variation in durability. So this offers another uh, view into that question, why are some disease organisms more harmful than others? This says, well, if you're a respiratory tract pathogen and you're durable in the external environment, you can sit and wait for the susceptibles to come. Natural selection then favors more predator-like exploitation of hosts than it does if you're a pathogen that's very labile in the external environment and therefore relies on hosts being healthy enough to get up and move around. In that case, natural selection puts a lid on how exploitative and hence how harmful the pathogens can be. Another big category of pathogens are those that infect the gastrointestinal tract. So if we've got an infected human um, in an environment in which contamination of water is quite feasible, where you don't have protected water supplies, um, <clears throat> that person, if they're infected and they can't move, can still infect tens, hundreds of other individuals. Um, and the way the infection takes place is that somebody who's sick in bed will have clothes or bed sheets removed by other people in the, in the household. They'll be washed in water supplies that are available. The water, water may move into uh, sources of drinking water or through, as a result of the movement of the water, as a result of rain that actually causes flooding and causes contamination of drinking water. People come to drinking water supplies and bring back um, water to the uh, household. And as a consequence, because these diarrheal pathogens can produce trillions of organisms during the course of an infection of, let's say, a few days, um, you can have one individual that can't move at all infecting hundreds of other individuals. Now, if you block waterborne transmission, uh, what you have is only routes of transmission that require people to be healthy enough to move around. People need to be healthy to go up and contaminate objects in the environment that other people will touch and then prepare food and, and um, eat contaminated food or, or put their hands in their mouth or touch a pencil, put the pencil in the mouth and so on. <clears throat> but those routes of transmission aren't as lucrative for the organism, but um, they also uh, require that people get up and move around um, to actually facilitate transmission. So for, if you block waterborne transmission, the only things that's left are routes of transmission that require people to be relatively healthy and as a result, favor the milder strains. At least that's the theory. So again, we can, in this case, we can compare um, organisms that are highly dependent on waterborne transmission, or at least that are often transmitted by water, versus those that are less waterborne, and see whether or not we get an association between harmfulness of the illness and the degree of waterborne transmission, as the theory expects. And the answer is yes. Here we've got, on the right-hand side, pathogens that are uh, generally waterborne. So we've got the classical biotype of Vibra cholerae, the, the um, Shigella dysentery type 1, the worst of these Shigella dysentery organisms, the organism causes typhoid fever. Here we've got <coughs> pathogens that are less dependent on waterborne transmission. Here we've got pathogens that are um, not dependent at all on waterborne transmission. And here we have death per untreated infection. So there's a strong positive association. So here again, this indicates, even though this is just one of the many tests that have been um, run on this uh, to evaluate this hypothesis. Again, it indicates that we're understanding more about why some organisms are harmful and that we may be able to use this understanding to, to assess whether a, an emerging pathogen is a real threat. Now, if we uh, look in hospital environments, we see a similar kind of transmission that does not depend on host mobility. And in this case, if we think about somebody who's in a hospital bed who is immobilized with a very severe illness, uh, that person can still serve as a source of infection for many other individuals because uh, most of the infections that are infecting people in hospital environments are transmitted on attendants, on the hands or the gloves of <coughs> nurses or doctors or other people um, looking after sick patients.
So here again, we expect that as there's more cycling in a hospital environment of a pathogen, uh, we expect that the pathogen should evolve to become more harmful. And this hasn't been tested very well, but there are some data that bear on this question. I think the most um, relevant test is one that was done <clears throat> on uh, E. coli in hospital environments before people realized uh, how to control E. coli effectively. So in this case, we're looking back at all of the outbreaks in the U.K. and the U.S of E. coli in hospital environments between uh, about 1940 when people realized E. coli was killing people in hospitals and about 1955 when everybody pretty much recognized that there were certain antibiotics you could use to effectively control E. coli. And so important thing here, uh, looking at each data point as pertaining to uh, one outbreak, is that there's a lot of variability, but there's a lot of harmfulness as well. Here's an outbreak in which a quarter of all the people who were infected died, and that outbreak lasted for over a uh, half year. So we've got some outbreaks that involved a lot of cycling in the hospital environment, some that involved very little cycling in the hospital environments, and the harmful variants tend to be uh, um, associated with the prolonged hospital outbreaks. So again, um, it's suggesting that transmission in hospitals may be one of the reasons uh, why we have a lot of hospital deaths, 90,000 deaths, uh, I didn't have it here, 90,000 deaths per year is the estimated number of deaths from nosocomial uh, infections. <clears throat> and a, a lot of that is bound to be a result of the vulnerability of people in hospitals. But when you look at data like this, it suggests that there's a lot of variability in the harmfulness of the organism, and um, that may be something that just was ignored because people so, could so readily say, ah, oh, it's just people vulnerable in hospitals. They, people didn't look to see whether the organisms were more harmful or not. This is especially important, I think, given that we have a lot of antibiotic usage in hospitals, and as a result, if you're getting more virulent variants of pathogens favored in hospitals and you're also getting them being antibiotic resistant, then you might be brewing some problems. So um, we could be concerned about diseases emerging in poor countries or rich countries or other categories of countries. But given that a lot of the attention in the United States is focused on things coming to us and causing terrible problems here, I think it's very important for us to ask, is it really likely to be a problem in the United States? So based on what I said so far, people might say, well, yeah, vector-borne transmission might be a big problem. And a lot of people are talking about uh, dengue, for example, in Mexico coming across the border and sweeping through the United States now that it's a little warmer and you've got a lot of mosquitoes that could transmit dengue, or <clears throat> malaria coming in through airports and people who are infected and then causing outbreaks like malaria used to cause in the United States during the 1800s and early 1900s. But I think the answer to this question of whether vector-borne pathogens really are grave threats, the United States is no. Even though they're harmful and they can be maintained, there's evidence that indicates that our infrastructure protects us against the danger of vector-borne pathogens. When we have a big, scary argument about malaria or dengue, which are really well-adapted pathogens for infecting humans and being transmitted from humans, and they can't make it, then we say we don't really have much to worry about those potentially big dangers. And then when somebody comes along and talks about West Nile, which can't even be transmitted from human to mosquito, then you ought to have a lot of skepticism about how big of a threat that is. Okay, so you begin to see how <clears throat> asking these questions begins to give us some power to distinguish the, the threats from the fizzlers um, when we're looking at these headlines that, that don't distinguish between it at all. The headlines are making as big of a deal out of influenza as they do out of dengue, and sometimes much bigger deal out of um, uh, uh, those or let's say West Nile, than out of something that we know is killing tens of thousands of people, uh, that is something that has recently got into humans and looks like it's going to be in humans for a long time, something like hepatitis C virus. Okay, so that's a story with vector-borne pathogens. Um, we can do the same thing for the sit and wait pathogens, these durable pathogens, <coughs> and also the waterborne pathogens. And the bottom line, for um, waterborne trans pathogens is the same as for vector-borne pathogens. Uh, because we have waterborne transmission blocked, even though cholera and dysentery and typhoid are scary things, they're really not much of a threat, nor is any other pathogen that could maintain itself as a highly virulent pathogen, a diarrheal pathogen, um, through waterborne transmission. <coughs> uh, sit and wait pathogens are a little bit more tricky um, because we don't have much of a problem with these pathogens, but, but there, it, the problem that is 
present can be pretty substantial in some parts. So if we think about tuberculosis, for example, if we get, when we get antibiotic resistant tuberculosis, in some areas in the country, that's a big threat. But it turns out that if one um, has good housing, the tuberculosis threat is greatly reduced. And most of the problem with tuberculosis um, being um, involved in outbreaks has been related to situations that allow transmission of durable um, uh, stages, durable um, pathogens in the external environment, things like uh, daycare centers or hospitals in which people aren't careful about negative air uh, flow. So he, he, with sit and wait pathogens, with dur if, if we find that there's a respiratory tract pathogens and people are, are concerned about, one of the first things we should do is ask, is it durable? And if the answer is yes, we have to put that on a list of you know, potentially um, important um, and, and dangerous pathogen, especially if it's antibiotic resistant or we don't have antibiotics to control it. I think hospital-acquired emerging diseases are big threats because we, are, we really aren't blocking attendant-borne transmission. And um, as I was saying before, we've got 90,000 deaths a year. This is a very high number. The last category that I want to talk about, which is also associated with a high threat, are sexually transmitted pathogens. Sexually transmitted pathogens, including those pathogens transmitted by kissing, um, are very mild in the short run. They have to be because people have to be mobile to be transmitted. But their, their harmfulness comes in terms of causing chronic diseases. And um, that harmfulness occurs because sexually transmitted pathogens are selected to be persistent. And once you've got a persistent pathogen, they're selected to be persistent because people aren't changing sexual partners. You know, most people aren't five, ten times a day. They're not going around kissing in a sort of juicy way. You know, five or ten, time, ten people a day. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're getting up and moving around and coughing, you could easily infect five or ten people a day. So these pathogens have to be persistent inside of hosts until sexual partners change or until people, um, you know, change their kissing partners. And really, to be successful, they have to be persistent much longer than that. So once they're persistent, then they're a wrench in the machinery. And that wrench, over years or decades, is shown to cause some really nasty um, chronic diseases. And so when we have a new emerging pathogen that looks like it's sexually transmitted, that's one that we really need to worry about. But this set of criteria really isn't used very much in assessing the relative threats. And just to give you a sense of this, we can look at <clears throat> something very quantifiable, easy to understand, deaths per year associated with the different kinds of pathogens. So here we've got most of the things that have grabbed headlines. Here, uh, here we've got chronic diseases, all of which have very strong infectious candidates for primary causation. So although we don't think of a lot, well, we think of AIDS as being that way and hepatitis C illness as being that way, we don't think of schizophrenia or we don't think of Alzheimer's or diabetes or cancers or cerebrovascular diseases <coughs> um, as being caused by infection. But again, in another lecture or two, I think I could convince you that the evidence is strongly supporting the idea that uh, good chunks, if not most, of all of these diseases are actually caused in a primary sense by infection. Here we've got our 90,000 deaths from nosocomial infections, <coughs> cancers. Uh, now 20 percent of cancers are accepted as being caused by infection. I think that the figure is going to probably be the majority by the time we figure all of this out. Um, and the same thing's true for cardiovascular, cerebrovascular diseases. So we're really, we really have to keep in mind the magnitude of these differences when we're talking about which infectious problems do we want to identify and try to resolve. Okay, so let's take a quick look at influenza. And what we're doing now is looking at a special case of this first category, which are diseases that have recently entered human populations from animal populations. Um, and again, I, what we have to do is come back to the question, how likely is the pathogen to be severe and to be transmissible? In this case, the uh, influenza viruses that we're concerned about aren't transmissible at all or very slightly from person to person. They're nowhere near maintenance. So they have to evolve that ability to be transmitted from person to person. So people are very concerned about this, mainly because of this one experience we had where we had the, one of the worst epidemics or pandemics uh, in the history of human existence occurring, killed about 20 million people in about a six-month period. That is an incredible high level of lethality. So people are worried about this because of that experience. If it happened once, it could happen again. There have been two additional pandemics, which were much more mild. And the dogma here is that these pandemics come in cycles. There's really no evidence for this, but people say it anyhow. Um, and people are concerned about this because we would be overdue now. And they're also concerned because we don't really have a good way of controlling influenza outbreaks. Just to give you some numbers on these, 
uh, that are trustworthy in the United States, we had over half a million people dying um, in 1918 and early 1919 from the uh, pandemic. 1957 pandemic, which was with H2N2, change in the hemagglutinin type, we had only 70,000 and um, 1968, which involved a change of hemagglutinin, but not neuraminidase, we had only 28,000. Um, what can we expect from H5N1? I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, H5 refers to the hemagglutinin protein, which is illustrated here. The N1 refers to the neuraminidase. In birds, it was first isolated in 1959. People don't talk about it too much. Mortality in birds varies tremendously from essentially none to 100%. The 100% uh, looks like the focus for these really nasty outbreaks has always been in poultry farms. Um, and uh, it's recently been spread throughout Asia and Africa um, and Europe. Uh, what about H5N1 in humans? Well, first identified in 1997, which is when people started getting worried about it. In that uh, year, it caused six deaths about, in about 18 known cases, and then recurred in 2004 when people started getting excited about this again. And so far, it's killed about 100 people and, and um, caused about 200 recognized cases of influenza in Asia and Africa. And there's virtually no human to human transmission. A little bit, but just barely equal on nothing that's uh, close to maintenance of uh, the virus. Now, people are always talking about this mutating to transmissibility. That's confusing evolution with mutation. What we're really talking about is how could it evolve to be uh, a human pathogen from uh, being a bird pathogen. The most important characteristic is evolution towards high transmissibility. And people talk about this as though this is just a simple thing. You get a mutation or a reassortment, suddenly you get a, this virulent pathogen that's highly transmissible without realizing all these things are interrelated. If you're talking about transmissibility, you have to consider changes in tropisms that will influence transmissibility, effects on host mobility. If people are sick for influenza, they're not likely to be mobile and not likely to transmit. Uh, viral shedding, anti-immune adaptations, triggering of behavioral responses like coughing. To, the idea that this somehow could get a mutation that would push this virus towards an optimum that would allow it to be highly transmissible like human adapted influenza is really quite preposterous. Yet people, because I think they're not thinking about evolution by natural selection, they're only thinking about mutation and reassortment, and they're thinking in a very simplistic kind of, you know, Lego type um, model where you you say, oh, transmissibility, boom, now we've got a transmissible virus, it's harmful. Um, I think that they've been leading everybody astray on this. And so that's why I've been saying since 1997, you know, this isn't, you say it's around the corner, I don't think so. I don't, and, and I became sort of a pariah, and, and I think people are a little less considering me a pariah now that the, the pandemic hasn't happened. But I'm, what I'm arguing is that you're not going to get a 1918 pandemic. The, the last point that I want to leave you with is that you can actually make predictions not only of what won't happen, we can also predict when we will get severe outbreaks. And chicken farms, you don't need to have chickens being mobile for high degrees of transmission because they're just so packed in so tightly. So <clears throat> in 1993, I made a prediction that we will continue to see lethal outbreaks in chicken farms, even though we won't see these similar kinds of lethal outbreaks in human populations. So the bottom line here is it should be reassuring for people, not very reassuring for chickens, but um, at least it's better that it goes that way than the other way.